I'd like to uh, take you on part of a journey that I was able to be part of a couple of months ago. And first to talk about sort of a uh, backstory to it, which I think illuminates all too much about where we are in terms of the warfare state in 2009. Uh, early this year with my colleagues at the Institute for Public Accuracy, we began to plan for a delegation to Afghanistan. And we felt that it was important to establish a channel of communication to Capitol Hill that was not filtered by the news media, not by the State Department or the White House or the Pentagon. And so we began to, as I know many people in this room have done in many different contexts, knock on the doors and make the calls and send the emails to congressional offices. And uh, by the end of the spring, we got a commitment from Congressman Michael Honda to be part of our delegation. Uh, you remember there were two votes on the supplemental bill, military uh, escalation spending in uh, Afghanistan. The second one actually counted, and he hung in there and voted against the supplemental. Uh, one of 30 anti-war Congress people to do that. And we thought, great, he's going with us. And then his top aide, who'd been organizing for congressional forums of the Progressive Caucus on Capitol Hill, he committed to going. Uh, Rick Reyes, who many of you know, the uh, uh, former Marine, now doing great anti-war work, uh, uh, agreed to go, and I got to sign up as well. And then two weeks before uh, our scheduled departure in late August, the State Department called Congressman Honda and said, we don't think you should go, it's too dangerous for a congressperson, and so he canceled out. And we thought, well, you know, it's hard, we were going to go incognito, but it's hard to uh, uh, keep your uh, name uh, and your identity secret if you're a congressperson. So it sort of kind of regretfully made sense to me. Uh, but then we talked to somebody I'd worked with at uh, Congressman Conyers' office, who writes some of his foreign policy speeches, a great guy, and he agreed to go. So it was me and Rick and these two congressional aides. And then 48 hours before our flights uh, out of the U.S. Uh, to uh, Dubai and then Afghanistan, uh, we, got, uh, we got the word, we got the word, we got the word. <laughs> All right. We got the word uh, that some calls had gone out to the offices of Congressman Conyers and Congressman Honda. And uh, long story short, the calls were initiated by the State Department and the House Intelligence Committee, routed through the Ethics Committee of the House, which had approved all of our applications to authenticate the legality of our trip. And the State Department and the House Intelligence Committee did not want those two congressional aides to go either. And so Congressman Honda and Congressman Conyers canceled the authorization for their staffers to go, and me and Rick went by ourselves. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because initially we might be surprised. What's the big deal about a couple of staffers from Capitol Hill going on a little independent delegation to Afghanistan? Well, I'm still searching for any indication that any Congress people on Capitol Hill or any staffers who work for Congress people have gone to Afghanistan outside what's called the CODEL trips, the bubble, outside of the official trips that are orchestrated are organized with itineraries drawn up by the U.S. Embassy, the State Department, and the so-called Department of Defense, at least uppercase Department of Defense. And I, I'm not aware of any of those entities working on Capitol Hill traveling to Afghanistan outside the bubble. And I was still, you know, somewhat puzzled by why go all through this effort to pull strings and so forth to prevent these two staffers from going with us. A few days into our visit to Kabul, Rick and I went to the Helmand District Camp 5 refugee facility. And it was uh, right in the capital of the country of Afghanistan. It was ditches, it was torn canvas, it was an occasional water pump. It was the residence and is the residence of 700 families people who lived in southern Afghanistan, who found themselves under the bombs, who went to the capital of their country. And Rick and I met Waqil Khan. And we sat in a little tent with 12 Afghan people who talked about what happened that morning about a year ago, 
when the bombs fell. And then Wakil Khan's daughter, Goljuma, talked about what happened a year ago when she was six years old. She said she later found out it was about 5 a.m. She just remembered that it was dark still. And she was awoken when the ground shook and the walls fell. And it turned out that that attack killed several members of her family. And her dad and she went to Kabul. The last meaningful contact that Mr. Khan and Goljuma had with the U.S. government was when those bombs fell. And as we got up to say goodbye, I realized that Goljuma now has one arm. What does it mean that the U.S. government can pay to drop bombs on villages in Afghanistan but can't pay to help the people who become refugees and sometimes invalids because of those bombs. Now, I don't think I'm a naive person, but I left that refugee camp trying to figure it out. How could this be? We're hearing about winning hearts and minds. We're hearing about how there are no military solutions and the U.S. government must bond with the people of Afghanistan. This is not an obscure location. This is in the capital of the country. How could that be? And then I remembered about the history that I'd been trying to learn about from the 1970s onward to today the role of the U.S. government and other foreign powers in Afghanistan. And I realized this war is not in its first priority about helping people in Afghanistan. It's not in its second or third or fourth or fifth priority about helping the people of Afghanistan any more than U.S. foreign policy has been with that priority in the 70s or 80s or 90s. And then you go back and you look at the numbers. The German sociologist uh, a few decades ago, I remember, uh, wrote that the budget is the skeleton of the state, stripped of all misleading ideologies. And the Progressive Caucus, when it held six forums, including often coordinated by the Honda staffer who was going to go on our trip before the State Department intervened, they